<laughs> well, good evening, everyone. Let's go ahead and begin our class. Uh, start with a word of prayer, if you'll bow with me. Heavenly Father, we come humbly bowing before you, just giving you praise and honor and glory. We thank you for just preserving our lives thus far, for making them just full, bursting with, with joy, with peace and understanding that in this world you, you have made us better and we look forward to that time in which we can be with you in eternity. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much for this time that we have together this evening, for the time we can open your word, consider the, the words of your son, consider the words of these men that you have given these words to for our betterment, for our understanding, for a pathway that we might follow to that home in heaven with you. May our time uh, together this evening be profitable. May it be well spent in discussing the things that will better each and every life here. Heavenly Father, we are especially mindful of those who are not, those who for reasons of sickness or just simply choices that they should not make are just not with us. We ask that you give us a chance to minister to them. We ask that you be with them and give them healing and peace that only you can provide. Heavenly Father, all these things we pray in your son's name and amen. All right. We uh, have got a little bit of work left to do in Matthew chapter 7, so we're going to turn there. Uh, and then um, we're going to just kind of peruse the notes for 1 Corinthians. Uh, we are going to start our study, and, and I guess officially the start will be next week uh, because, um, well, uh, unless you've read it, you, you haven't had the notes uh, and you haven't had the questions and you've not had really a chance to look at it. So uh, it's um, kind of begin, going to begin next week, but we're going to take a look at the notes. I'm going to run through some of the things um, in the notes uh, that uh, are fairly consistent uh, expectations, maybe answer any questions that uh, you have. Uh, but um, we're in uh, Matthew chapter 7, uh, and we're finishing up uh, the Sermon uh, on the Mount. Uh, and uh, we have just the, the very last section, uh, the very last, sec last section of uh, chapter, uh, chapter 7 uh, that we're, we're looking at, um, finishing up with the, uh, the wise builder and the foolish builder, and then uh, the final two verses uh, of the chapter. Uh, of course, we've already pointed out that in this chapter, uh, there seems to be this common thread uh, that uh, runs through uh, the entire thing, and it's all about uh, doing the will of God uh, or knowing the will of God. It, it kind of centers on his word or his wisdom or his uh, instruction. If you go back to, <clears throat> for instance, verses uh, 21 through 23, it's kind of the, uh, the, the straightforward, um, bold statement uh, about the chapter as a whole, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, we're in the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. All right, so we come down to this uh, section in 24 through 27, uh, and it's really just kind of an illustration uh, of what he had talked about in the previous verses. Um, you know, he says that if you are the kind of person who um, is going to build your life, uh, you're going to build uh, all that you are, all that you do, uh, the things that uh, you pursue uh, upon uh, the foundation that is God's word, then you're going to be like a wise builder uh, who gives careful deliberation to where he builds his house. Uh, and of course, the house is a major investment. Um, for us today, you know, I don't think there's probably many of us who actually build our own homes. You know, I mean, I, I didn't lift a single brick to build my house. Um, but I do maintenance it, uh, and uh, I did carefully consider where it is, uh, property values, things like that, crime, so on and so forth. But I didn't build the house. Um, back in this day and age, uh, you, you know, people, uh, people, um, you know, building their own homes uh, would have been a little bit more uh, of the reality than it, it perhaps is uh, today, um, and. For us, it's more about an investment of, of money. For them, it would have been more about an investment of time uh, and uh, energy. But either way you want to look at it, it's a big investment. Uh, it's a big investment 
Uh, it's a big uh, outlay of you know, some energy, some time, some effort uh, on our part. So this, this is not a decision to be made uh, lightly. Uh, so the careful builder, the wise builder, uh, is the person who um, considers very carefully where he's going to build his house. Uh, he's not just concerned about the moment. You know, if, if we get wrapped up in just the, the single moment of time, uh, then it may appear as, every, as if everything's okay. You know, this day's sunny, it's not raining, um, all is, you know, well with the world. Uh, and in that case, you might, uh, you know, consider, hmm, well, I really like the outdoors. I think I'm going to build a house without a roof. <laughs> you know, that would be silly, wouldn't it? Just because it's not raining one day doesn't mean it's not going to rain, you know, tomorrow. Uh, so here, the wise man, you know, look at what he does. And I mean, you just think about it and it, and it really makes sense. He, he carefully considers, where am I going to build this house? Uh, and built into that question is, okay, what's this going to look like in the future? You know, what, what's going to happen uh, when, you know, uh, when the, you know, the rains come? And what's going to happen when, you know, the storm uh, comes? Uh, because it comes. It doesn't take uh, too much of living to, to realize that that is the case. Uh, you can just simply look around you and realize storms come. Things happen. Difficulties uh, are bound to come to us. Uh, if we learn anything from the Old Testament, uh, especially going back to the patriarch Job, uh, is that man's days are, you know, what? Few and full of trouble, right? Yeah. They're few and full of trouble. Trouble comes, and that's the way it is. So we do well then to try our best uh, to gird ourselves against that trouble when it does come. So the wise man builds his life, which is really what we're talking about, uh, upon the solid foundation, which is God's word. Because it's not only good today, it's good tomorrow, uh, and it's good into eternity. And no matter what happens, if we build our life upon God's word, uh, then we're not going to perish. You know, and even if our physical life were to be consumed, we still go to be with God. Uh, there's the wise builder. You look at the foolish builder, and the foolish builder um, is the one who, you know, <clears throat> builds upon uh, the, the sand uh, and the and uh, everyone who hears, okay, hold on. Yeah, everyone who hears these words uh, of mine and does not do them uh, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And again, the same thing happens to him as happened to the wise man. The rain comes, the storm's there, um, the waters rise, and it beats against the house, uh, only this house doesn't stand. Um, so. We talked a little bit about last time, what is the sand? You know, what is the sand? Well, the sand is pretty much anything not God's word, right? You know, we're either building on God's word or we're building on uh, something else. And I think we narrowed it down to the, the idea that we're building on God's will or we're building on our will. You know, we do what we want to do and we do, or we do what God uh, wants us uh, to do, uh, wants us to do. Uh, so we can choose to be wise or we can choose to be, you know, foolish. And, and then the final thing uh, very simply is this. Um, at the end of the section about the wise man, it just simply says um, that uh, the house did not fall because it was founded on the rock. Okay? Now, compare that to the end uh, of the, um, the foolish man. It says, uh, and uh, the winds blew and it beat against the house and it fell and great uh, was the fall uh, of it. Okay, so what does all that mean? What does all that mean? Even if we take out the whole house thing and we say he's talking about life, building your life, the things you do specifically, right? And because he talks about anyone who hears these words and does them, all right? Anyone who hears these words and does them is like a person who builds his house on the rock and it's going to stand. Uh, it's going to stand. Uh, and then the guy who doesn't hear or maybe hears those words but doesn't do them, uh, it's going to fall. What exactly, what exactly are we saying there? You, your life is going to stand and your life is going to fall? What, what does that mean? What's that mean? You've got to follow God's teaching. 
Well, yeah, certainly you got to follow God's teaching, right? Or, you know, you're going to wind up where you don't want to be. You're going to wind up what? Where you don't want to be. Wind up where you don't want to be? Okay. All right, Chris. And so if that's the idea of how we're building our life, then, then I think you are talking about eternity. And so you're talking about where you're going to spend eternity if you're going to be solidly uh, built on a strong foundation or if you're going to be a complete collapse. You know, which you can take it to mean heaven and hell. You can take it to mean at peace during this life or chaos and confusion. And we can look at it a couple of ways. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there are a couple of different ways uh, that you can, you know, look at it. Um, one way, and, and uh, I, I, don't, I don't remember where I read it, um, but in studying for it, I, I ran across this uh, interpretation that basically sees the, the, the story play out like this, that yes, it is your life. Uh, you know, building the house is your life, um, and you can build it on the foundation of God, uh, but when it gets down to talking about whether you stand or whether you uh, fall, um, they, they saw uh, the rain coming and the flood waters rising uh, as testing, um, and specifically the testing of the judgment of God um, for eternity. Uh, it's the same thing that you would see when, you know, Paul talks about how everyone builds their house. Uh, and some of those works will stand and some of those works will, will not. Uh, and, you know, I mean, could that be the case? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, but I, I do think ultimately it is talking about, um, <clears throat> you know, standing until the day of eternity. Uh, and the fall is, is, is called a great fall because eternity is at stake. I mean, if the house fell and it was no big deal, then, okay, whatever, go build a new one, you know, just build it cheaply this time. So when it falls again, you can redo it, uh, you know, so it says it fell and great was the fall of it. I, I think the greatness here uh, is that depiction uh, of what is at stake, and that is, you know, eternity. Wait. Okay. All right. Yeah. Very good. Uh, it's um, it, it's kind of interesting that that uh, Christ uh, closes the Sermon on the Mount, uh, you know, this way, uh, and that's kind of what I wanted to to look at just last in, in this section. 
Uh, I mean, of all the things that, you know, he could say, and there's many profound things in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and there's just a lot of amazing truths. And uh, we've seen uh, as we've gone through just uh, some, you know, very beloved passages that, you know, most of us know, beginning uh, with the opening verses uh, and what we call the the, the Beatitudes. Uh, and of course, this story too is one of those beloved stories that we kind of uh, turn into a children's song uh, to encourage them to, you know, build their life upon doing God's Word, uh, about doing God's Word. Um, so, you know, why do you think he ends this way? Well, I, I mean, I think he, he ends this way. He ends the Sermon on the Mount this way, um, you know, because ultimately, This is what it comes down to. It comes down to the decision that you will make. You know, he spent a lot of time talking about this is what the kingdom is going to be like. This is what the person in the kingdom is going to look like. But ultimately, it comes down to, okay, what choice will you make? I'm offering you the solid rock, but there's also the sand. You know, there's wisdom, there's foolishness. It's up to you to choose. Uh, you know, which one you're, you're going to follow. Uh, and of course, Christ is never going to compel anybody uh, to do or pick either one aside from teach them what the truth, you know, is. Um, but um, it's such a fitting ending, I believe, uh, to the entirety of, uh, of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and uh, it's so easily understood uh, that, you know, kids singing that song, they get it. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. It's, it's pretty simple. Um, you got to build your life upon doing what God says. All right. But uh, any, any thoughts on that? Thoughts different? Okay. Well, then let's look at the last couple of verses. Last couple of verses. <clears throat> and when Jesus had finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished uh, at his teaching. Uh, for he was teaching them as one who had authority uh, and not uh, as the scribes. Uh, now, these verses are not part of the speech that uh, Christ gave, but it is the reaction uh, to the, the speech. Uh, and uh, I think it's very telling. Um, but I want to start with kind of what it says last. Um, he, he says, they spoke uh, as one, he spoke as one having authority uh, and not as the scribes. Um, who were the scribes? Who were the scribes? Weren't they the people who copied the scriptures? Yeah, I mean, it comes from, uh, you know, um, the word itself, you know, comes from that idea of, of writing. Uh, of writing. Uh, in the original language, uh, it's from the, uh, the word, I'm going to butcher it. It's, it's one of the, the hard ones for me to say, Grama, grammateos. I think is how you say it. Um, and of course, in that, in that word, you can see the word grammar. You can see the word grammar. Um, but it's, uh, he was, they were the person, they were the people who, um, you know, kept the law. Uh, they were, they were the folks who, who would, you know, write out, uh, the, the, uh, write out the, the scrolls and, and keep the scrolls. And, and they were in charge, uh, of those types uh, of things. But, why do you think he compares? Uh, why do you think they, they draw the comparison between, you know, Christ uh, and the scribes, uh, the people who wrote out the law? Shirley and then Carrie. But the uh, scribes were always uh, saying what somebody else said. If somebody else gave them the authority to say that, where Jesus was the authority. Okay. All right. A scribe just kind of wrote down what someone else was saying. Uh, where he would take one scroll uh, and copy it, you know, to another uh, scroll. Okay, they weren't his words; it wasn't his authority. Uh, they were just a, a, a writer, kind of like uh, an amanuensis, you know, who sits and dictates uh, while someone else speaks. You know, Paul would would do that. Um, you know, for many of his letters, uh, he didn't actually write it with his hands. As a matter of fact. He goes out of his way on one occasion to say, I have written this with my own hand, because it was not his practice uh, to write his own letters. Okay, very good. Okay. That's what I was going to say, what she said. Yeah. Okay, yeah. They're they're, they're, they're writers of it. It's, it's, you know, not their words. Um, Christ comes along and and, um, he speaks with one who, you know, is the, the final 
uh, say on matters. You know, he is the source, um, not the person who's copying uh, the, you know, the words of somebody else. Uh, he is the source of, of these, these words, uh, and um, uh, it, it's a very powerful thing. Carrie. Okay. Whereas the Pharisees, I mean, they, I don't know if you were tying this, you know, they kind of were uh, caught up in their own power, I guess. It was more about a different kind of power or a different kind of authority that they were. I didn't know if that was the point that you were making there. Um, no, I mean, it's a good point. Uh, you know, um, there was obviously something different about Christ. Uh, and um, they draw this contrast between the keepers of the law and the one who is giving uh, the law. Uh, but uh, in order to fully understand that, you've got to kind of go back and, and look at the, the verse before it. Um, why did they get that impression? You know, why did they get this impression that he was a person who had this... Um, you know, uh, authority. And, and authority in this case um, may not fully be exactly what we, we think. We think authority, we think someone who is, um, you know, in a, uh, in, in a position of, you know, power, the great high head and potentate. Uh, of something. And, and that, this word is kind of used that way, but it's also a word, uh, that means to have mastery over something. You, you know, um, when you have authority, uh, in a specific discipline, you, you know, uh, then, um, you, you can tell. Uh, you, you can tell. I, I mean, you ever go, you go to school and you sit at the feet of, you know, teachers, um, it's pretty apparent whether the teacher actually knows what they're talking about uh, or, or, you know, they, they don't uh, because they can speak with authority. They're excited about it and, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, it does mean, you know, to have this uh, position, uh, this uh, influence, uh, but it also kind of blends that with this idea of um, having a mastery or a fine grasp uh, of something. Uh, so they weren't just, the comparison is not just about, you know, his kind of um, uh, the projection of who he was or um, the uh, forcefulness of his nature uh, to, you know, it wasn't that he was, you know, banging the, the pulpit uh, to show that he had power. Um, he displayed a, a mastery, uh, a mastery that led them to believe that he was, uh, uh, had this superior knowledge, uh, is essentially what, what it's uh, saying. But uh, he spoke as one having authority, not as the scribes. It doesn't take much to look at a word here and copy it over here. Just because they could copy the law, that doesn't mean they had mastery of the law. That doesn't mean they fully understood the law. They were the scribes. They wrote out the law. Now, if you wanted to know how to write out the law, you wanted to know how to, and they were meticulous about this. Um, you, you know, how many words would fit on a page and, you know, what that page should look like and what happens if there was a slip of the pen. Um, you, you know, that's where their mastery lied. You know, that's, that's where, you know, they were the masters, put it that way. Um, you, you know, but this is not that. You know, Christ spoke as one who had authority beyond that. Wayne? I go back and remember, we already covered this. Go you know, back uh, a little bit ago. He said, You've heard it said before. This is the scribes. You've heard it said before, but I say to you, and I can just. Hear the reaction if there was one. Probably more thought than vocalized, but here's one. Well, who do you think you are? 
You know, I mean, that would be the reaction. Is you know, you've heard all this. This is what they've told you all along. This is what you know. But I say to you, and it's like, yeah, well, <laughs> right? Who are you? You know, I mean, they they were amazed that he would have the audacity to even come out and suggest that. He knew better than all these other people. I said, well, you know, and that just really struck them up right there, you know. So I would see how this reaction here would really be, you know, something of a, you know, a real step back and uh, look, wait a minute, what would you say? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, and that's true. And uh, of course, he says that earlier in the in the sermon. But yeah, very good, Ralph. Yeah, and we can bring that up to today's world too. You know, people are teaching Jesus, but they're not teaching the truth. They tell people you don't have to be baptized, you don't have to do this, you don't have to do that, you have to do this, and all these different things. And they're just like. The Pharisees and the scribes. I mean, the scribes only copied what they heard, but the people that taught the scribes, the teachers, are the ones that were wrong. And and we have the same thing in this world today. Okay. Very much so. Yeah, I mean, and that's certainly true. Vivian Oh, I'm sorry, Vivian. Go ahead. Um, okay. They also always thought of him as the carpenter's son and they never looked at him as anybody having any education or anything so they were really amazed at what he did say yeah and certainly that's the case uh, you know if we go back to the context where um you know he, he goes to his hometown uh or he goes to the places where he grew up and that's the case you know uh and he himself basically even says you know a prophet is you know, not respected in his hometown. You know, he doesn't have honor there. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's certainly the case. Okay, so, you know, why the comparison? Well, the previous verse tells us. Um, it says that, uh, and when he had finished, when he had, when he had finished, uh, oh, come on. When Jesus had finished these sayings, the crowds uh, were astonished uh, at his teaching. Okay. Uh, the word here for teaching is um, didache, which means doctrine, and it's just that. It's, it's teaching. Um, they understood uh, that he uh, was there uh, to instruct them, uh, and he came off, you know, that way. Uh, but the, probably the key word here is the word uh, astonished. Um, literally means to be stricken with amazement. You know, it's not just simple, you, you know, surprise. Um, the, the word literally means to be stricken with uh, amazement. Uh, and uh, so here's the, these people, they're listening to his words, he's going along, uh, and uh, just every sentence, they're just stricken uh, by, you, you know, the things that, that he is teaching. Uh, and uh, we're not told exactly um, why that is, uh, but we do know they walked away thinking, this guy knows what he's talking about. You know, he's not like these guys over here. This guy actually knows what he's talking about. Uh, and it was impressive for them, you know, to, to behold. Um, so it's, you know, it caused them to, to be continually amazed, uh, you know, through the whole thing. Uh, through the whole thing. Okay. And, of course, um, we'd be kind of, you know, in, I don't say in the wrong, but you know, we, it would be kind of remiss of us if we did not, you know, encourage that same thing today. Uh, you, you know, we ought to daily uh, seek uh, that uh, stricken with astonishment or stricken with amazement um, in the presence of God. You know, whether it's uh, considering the, the world that he has made or picking up his word and studying it or witnessing the answer to prayer uh, or, you know, some other aspect uh, of our walk of faith. Uh, you know, we ought to you know, constantly be um, in, in awe 
uh, of him, uh, in awe of God, in awe of the sacrifice that Christ uh, has made for us. I mean, isn't that kind of what the, you know, the wise man concluded about the meaning of life? You know, so what is the end of it all? You know, to what? Fear God, keep his commandments. You know, to stand in awe of the presence of God and keep his commandments. Do the things that he says. Um, and of course, in many ways, we've seen that here in the Sermon on the Mount uh, as, uh, as well. All right, any other one? final comments? We've come a long way. It's taken us a long time to, to get through it. Uh, just three chapters at the beginning of it, we're thinking, three chapters, come on. How long could that possibly take? You know, six, seven months later, here we are. Uh, we finally made it through. Um, but uh, it's been a wonderful study, uh, and I do hope you enjoyed it. Uh, but uh, let's go ahead and introduce, um, we're not really introducing Corinthians, uh, but we are going to be starting Corinthians. You'll notice it's kind of thick. Uh, and I will tell you this, the reason it's this thick uh, is because I was shooting for everybody, uh, everybody, uh, when I chose the font and the font size. Um, Could have made the font a lot smaller, but some of folks would not be able to read it that well. <laughs> so I tried to go big on the font uh, and ended up using probably double the pages we needed, but I figured that would be a great benefit. So don't let the thickness of it be too daunting for you. Um, but uh, just kind of pick it up, and, and I would encourage you to peruse it. The first thing we're going to do next week is talk about the, the introduction. Uh, who's Paul? Who are these Corinthian people? Where did they come from? Why is Paul even writing them? Uh, why is Paul even writing them? Uh, and um, what's their background? You know, because especially with uh, this letter, uh, it's very important for us to understand some things about Corinth. Uh, because Paul is going to talk about things in the book, uh, and it's almost as if Paul was writing uh, us having known about some previous conversation. Uh, so it's going to be vitally important for us to understand some of the history uh, of Corinth, some of the difficulty uh, there uh, about uh, the original work that Paul did there. Uh, and of course, we're going to talk a little bit about Paul and some of his journeys. Um, if there are typos, just fix them and move on. Uh, I'm sure there's many, so don't feel like you have to come tell me about everyone unless, it, <laughs> unless you just don't understand what it's trying to say. Um, but uh, uh, anyhow, so we're going to be introducing the book first. So uh, in this first week, uh, and everything's kind of based on a week. Uh, nobody expects you to memorize uh, any of this, um, but I would encourage you to uh, do two, um, two things. If you don't do anything else, if you don't uh, answer any single question, and of course the first set of questions um, are about three pages in, and there's only seven of them, um, even if you don't answer a single question, the two things that I would like you to do, and, and nobody throw anything at me, because it's, you know, I'm trying to set the bar high, uh, is just to read through the introduction, uh, but I want you to re sit down, and in one setting, if you can, you know, take a break, maybe get yourself some Darjeeling, uh, or, you know, whatever it is that you like to, to drink, um, and sit down and try to read 1 Corinthians in one setting, uh, in one setting. Uh, and I want you to do that, um, keeping in mind a couple of things. Are there things Paul repeats? Okay. Is there some common theme? You know, for instance, does he use the word unity over and over and over and over and over? Does he use the word righteous over and over? Now, I'm not saying this is, okay, but I mean, you know, do you find that there are things he does over and over? Uh, but uh, 1 Corinthians, is, it's, it's not that large of a book. Uh, I mean, it's not the smallest either, uh, but... Um, you could probably sit and read it, and if you did it kind of all in one shot and you're, you know, even the average reader, you could probably do it in less than an hour. Okay? Hmm? 35, 35 minutes. That's Wayne's record. Somebody got to beat it. Uh, that's, that's what they put down in my Bible. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll say it's Wayne's record. <laughs> so, yes. Okay. Yeah, I got a whole stack up here. Um, the, the other thing, uh, the, the other thing that I want to encourage you in, as you notice, lots of paper, lots of paper, P 
Paper nowadays, not cheap. Okay, so try to keep your book. Uh, try to keep your book. If you, if you take it, please bring it back uh, with you. Um, you know, if, if you want me to three-hole punch it and put it in a binder for you, you just come tell me. I'll be more than happy to do that. Uh, you know, whatever it, whatever it takes to, to get you to take it home, bring it back. Um, but, um, you know, to, to have to print them over and over and over and over uh, is just going to get very, very costly. Uh, but, you know, if you take it home and your dog eats it, I'm not going to believe you, number one. Uh, but, uh, you know, <laughs> but I'll give you another one. Uh, but anyhow. Um, we do have some more up here, uh, and I will have a few more out um, for uh, Sunday morning, uh, so just in case uh, folks do lose theirs. Uh, but remember, two things. Just read through the introduction, and, and the most important thing is just sit down and read Corinthians in one setting. If you get to the questions, awesome. If you get it all done, great. Uh, but that's kind of our goal for next time. Answer those seven questions, read the introduction, read through the book in one setting. Uh, in one setting. Um, if I were you, I would read through the questions first, just so you know, because it's going to ask you those things. It's going to ask you, do you notice any patterns? Do you notice any repeated words? You, you, things like that. So you, you can know that's coming in advance, uh, and you can sit and read. Uh, but um, that, that's really about it. Other than that, I, I kind of wanted to just kind of go over uh, the format just a little bit. Every lesson is going to be about the same. Sometimes I do insert, uh, for instance, like here, just a little bit of white space um, where you can kind of put your answers in. Because, I, I mean, in some of these questions, I don't leave you a lot of room. Um, but that was kind of a compromise with the larger text. Um, you, you know, I, I figured uh, we'd we'll leave some white space every once in a while so to kind of let you expand your... your uh, your writing, uh, but if you have to, just write on a separate, separate sheet of paper uh, or abbreviate, uh, however you want to do it. Um, if, if you want to keep a journal aside from this, uh, or just have a separate notebook where you just kind of label it chapter one or section one, uh, and just kind of have it match up, that's fine. I'm not going to tell you how to do that. Do what works best for you. Uh, if it doesn't work best for you, then odds are you're probably not going to do it. Uh, so figure out what works best for you. Um, now don't come back and say, you know what works best for me? I'm not doing it. <laughs> I doubt any of you would say that. Uh, but, um, you, you know, I, I would encourage you to figure out what works best for you. you I mean, maybe, maybe you're a sit down at the computer typing type of person. Um, I, I, liked, I like to do that. If I were writing it next day, I might not be able to read it. Uh, that's just kind of the way I write. Uh, but each, uh, each one of the lessons, um, once you get into the actual lesson, uh, is going to give you the text. Uh, we're considering, uh, f for instance, chapter uh, or lesson two, uh, chapter one, verses one through 17. Uh, so those are the verses that you, you need to have read uh, by this point. Um, key verse, uh, key verse is the one that's quoted uh, there. It says key verse, lesson two, and then it has the verse that's quoted. That uh, is the key verse. Now, here's the thing. I, I, would, I, I would just be amazed uh, and would certainly love if someone came in and said, you know, Brother Ed, I, I don't think chapter 1 and verse 10 is the key verse. I think chapter 1 and verse 15 is the key verse. And then explain why. You know, so just because Ed says it's the key verse, that doesn't mean it's the key verse. Right? Uh, so, you know... You read through the chapter, and, and this is just to encourage you to, to kind of, you know, think along that line. Uh, and then there's a little bit of text by way of summary. Here's what is going to be taught here. Uh, and then it just begins the questions. Uh, and the questions are the bulk of it. Uh, and then it gives you an assignment. Uh, but I can tell you what the assignment is every time. Okay, the assignment uh, every time is read this passage every day before the upcoming class. Okay, every day, and it has these things. Sometimes that's going to be unrealistic for you, but if we don't set the goal high, then, you know, we'll just stay low. Uh, so I encourage you to read, 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 and then read more. Um, that's the best way to understand any book of the Bible, is to read it, reread it, read it again, uh, and then you can answer these questions. 
Uh, if you ever have questions about the questions, feel free to just text me, email me, call me, whatever, uh, if it's that important to you, um, or bring it to class and we can, we can talk about it. Uh, some of these questions are mine. Many of them uh, I've just gathered from various sources uh, that, um, uh, where I found uh, it, you know, these things uh, interesting. Uh, but uh, that's the lesson, so take it. Uh, and again, remember the assignment for next week. Read. That's it. Appreciate it. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> In the 19th chapter of John, the Jews wanting to crucify Jesus presented, presented him before Pilate. And Pilate said unto Jesus, he said, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? And Jesus replied, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. If God does not want something to happen, it is not going to happen. In similar manner, if God has a plan for something to happen, it is going to happen. In Jeremiah 29, it was God's plan that the southern kingdom of Judah be carried away into Babylonian captivity. Jeremiah 29.4, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Because of Judah's disobedience and idolatry, it was God's plan that they be carried away from Jerusalem into Babylon. And while in Babylon, they were instructed to go about their daily lives. They were told to build houses, to marry, to have children, and to multiply there. Even though they were ex experiencing the trials of being under the subject of another nation, they were to continue life as God instructed them to. They were also told to seek the welfare of the city that they were exiled to, and they were to pray on behalf of that city. And we're told that their captivity was not going to be short. It was going to be 70 years, and there would be some that would not return back and see Israel again. And God gave them these words for them to carry on. In Jeremiah 29, 11 through 14, it says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. As a loving and concerned father, God knew that his children needed discipline. Therefore, it was God's plan that through their captivity that they might recognize their rebellious attitude and change their ways. That they might learn to humble themselves and to desire to seek after God. And after the 70 years of captivity were accomplished, the Jews were allowed to return back to Israel. And upon their return home, we see that there was a great revival among them. We see the temple was rebuilt, the law was restored, and the walls of Jerusalem were rebuilt. The nation would once again return to God who had delivered them. And just as God had plans for Judah and the people of Judah for them to desire to seek after him, it is God's plan today as his, pil his children to please God and to seek after him. Hebrews 11.6 says, but without faith, it is impossible for us to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. It wouldn't it be great if each morning, every morning we woke up diligently seeking God. Amen. I know that that's not the first thing on my mind. When I wake up, my eyes open up. Unfortunately, I'm thinking about, if it's a work day, all the chores and tasks that I have to get done on that work day. And they want you to get more done on one day than you can the whole week. 
And even if it's not a work day and I wake up, my mind is usually centered around, well, what, what do I need to do around the house? What other chores do I need to do? But what I should be thinking is how can God use me today? What is your will for me on this given day? What opportunities lie before me? How can you use me to accomplish your will today? You know, the truth is that God wants us to be in the world. He doesn't want us to be of the world, but he wants us to be in the world. He wants, to be, he wants us to be honest. He wants us to be working in the world. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 warns us of idleness. It says, if a man is not willing to work, let him not eat. So God does want each of us to be busy working. He wants us to be responsible. And he wants us to be concerned about the things that we are doing. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, what your hands find to do, do with all your might. Give it your best. But even though God wants us to be out in the world working, to be concerned about doing our best, he does not want us to be overburdened with care. He doesn't want us to be overcome by the trials that come through responsibilities. And trials do come upon us. And that's why James gives us some advice on handling trials and difficulties. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And let patience have its perfect work, that you may be complete, lacking nothing. You know, just maybe the trials I'm working through today is training me for something bigger tomorrow. Amen. Maybe the hard work and sweat I encounter today is making me stronger for something else. We know that no matter what trials we face today, if we let God work through us, not only will, will we be better for it, but others will be better for it too. For nothing we do in the Lord is useless. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. God is at work accomplishing his plans through his people. Are you one of God's people? Are you one of God's children? If not, you can, be, you can become one of God's children the same day that they became God's children on that first Pentecost uh, after the ascension of Jesus. It's recorded in Acts chapter 2, where Peter stood up and told them about Jesus and how it was God's purpose and foreknowledge that they would put Jesus to death and that God raised him from the dead and that God made that Jesus both Lord and Christ. And the Bible says when they heard this, that they were pricked in their hearts, that they were pierced, that they were touched, and they asked that question that should always be asked, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in Acts 2, in verse 41, it says, those that received the word and were baptized were added to the church by the Lord. Tonight, if you desire to become a child of God, we would like to take this opportunity to invite you to come forward and make it be known. But if you need, also if you need the prayers of the congregation for any reason, we would encourage you to come forward now as we stand and sing.